Hi, I'm Mike Maloney, and welcome to another CSRM podcast. Today's episode is hosted by Dr. Greg Glenville. Well, welcome again to another CSRM podcast. And uh, when you're watching this, we're getting closer and closer to Christmas. So Merry Christmas. And for all the sports ministers out there, maybe you're right in the middle of wrapping up a league or preparing for the new year, maybe a new fitness class taking full advantage of New Year's resolutions. Um, we, we're praying for you. We know that this is a busy time on top of family responsibility and uh, Christmas celebrations and things like that. So we're praying for you. And uh, we hope this podcast is a blessing as we continue to dive into the book, The Saving of Sports Ministry. I'm joined today with uh, Scott Stedman and Dr. Greg Linville. And we teased kind of the middle of chapter seven last time about this concept of the carnal Christian. And so, Dr. Greg, we're going to dive right in. What a great topic for us to spend some time on here, a very light topic. But uh, tell us what a carnal Christian is and, and why it's in Chapter 7 of this wonderful book. Well, carnal Christian, uh, if you think of uh, carne and you think of flesh, um, carnivorous etc and and so it, it's it's basically saying that a christian lives in the flesh more than in the spirit and they're they're not really following jesus they're following their flesh so that's the overall concept of the carnal christian but i think there's two things that we need to kind of found this conversation on and and the first one is that we take very seriously within CSRM, our relationships. Uh, that's part of our two R's, our relationships and, and resources. And we we do things like have staff emeritus because we believe that people have all this wisdom and experience and, and we want to keep in relationship with them. And and honoring people and honoring ministries is it's 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 part of our core values. And what might be perceived today is that we're going to uh, be attacking one of our ministry partners. That's not what we're doing. We're not attacking. We are critiquing. We are asking people to think about some things. And the, our hope is, is that we will help people get to a better understanding of this soteriology. Again, what does it mean to be saved? Soter in the Greek, and ology, kind of the words of the study. And so, what are we what are we studying about? What does it mean to be saved? And so, that's the first thing: is that we're not attacking, and we'll come back to that a little bit. But the second thing is that when we when we think about two words, heretic or apostate, that comes in this kind of conversation as well. Let's define those two for us. Uh, Dan and Scott, again, I'm not, I don't mean this in a mean way, but you're both heretics. And, and so am I. Um, we, in other words, a heretic has a heretical view about something. And, and I, I don't have a perfect theology as much as I've worked at it. You guys don't. Uh, and nobody really does other than the Lord Jesus. Paul came close to it, uh, and what he wrote was certainly not heretical. But there were times in his life that he did hold heretical views. And, and it's only Jesus that was perfect in this way. Now, we could say, well, there's the ultimate heretic, that that's who we would call an apostate, someone who has absolutely said, I don't care about what God wants. I don't care about Jesus. I only am going to say what I want. And I'm going to go into the Bible and things that I wanted to say, because that's good for me. And I'm the God of the universe, etc. So the people that we're talking about today, including ourselves, are heretics, but they're not the ultimate heretic of being an apostate. So those two things we just need to kind of get out on the ground floor. 
thoughts or questions there, guys? We understand where we're at. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, and I, I think for the sports minister, um, your doctrine, your theology is going to develop the closer you get yes. to the Lord, the more you investigate, um, the more you recognize, boy, I thought this, but I dug into the scripture and it, it was wrong. And so I think this is a strong encouragement to all sports ministers to just grow, grow in your doctrine, grow in your theology. Uh, we're all on a journey. And um, Greg, you're right. Uh, I don't think I would have ever accepted being called a heretic, but there's times that we have to grow because we're we're just wrong. And yeah. uh, the scriptures teach us. So, so Scott, I, think I, I cut you off, Scott. Sorry. Oh, no, I was just going to agree. Yeah. With everything, you're good. <laughs> so, so we have this baseline then, and uh, of that we honor people, and we're trying to wrestle with what could be, what we happen to think is, um, a less than biblical view about salvation. The the carnal Christian, there's no way to get around this because there is one very, very great ministry that has kind of put that out there, that there's a carnal Christian, that a person that is not following Jesus, but still a Christian. And and that is what used to be called Campus Crusade, now Crew. And let me go a step further. Crew was a group that really helped disciple me. And in fact, Dr. James Miller who I give a lot of credit to, saw something in me as a teenager. And he invested in me. He sent me to what was then Explo 72, probably before most people were even born. Uh, and it was the, the, the great time that all of Campus Crusade at that time came together and were trained in how to go bring people to Jesus and personal evangelism. And I was a benefit of that ministry. And then Dr. Miller walked me through the transferable concepts that that crew had. Today, I'm personally supporting crew staff, financially, prayerfully supporting them. So it's not like we have a problem with crew. The AIA, which is the athletic ministry with under, underneath of crew's overarching uh, organization. Also, we have loved, I have trained AIA staff at the seminary level. I am supporting AIA staff financially, prayerfully. We, We love this group, but we think that we need to really rethink this whole thing about being a carnal Christian. Okay, why do we, why do we want to go there because we think that it makes an easy out for Christians that as long as I pray this prayer and cruise four spiritual laws, which is a good prayer, there's no magic bullet. There's no one prayer, but there's, and that is a, it's a good model. Basically saying you're God. I'm not, I'm sinful. I need your cross, you're dying on a cross for my sins, and I have to take that personally and make it real for me and accept what you're giving me. I mean, it's a great prayer. But then what they say is that after that, that you can set Jesus aside. And they diagram it with some of their pictures, and they have a circle that represents the life and there's a throne kind of a chair looking thing and what sits on the throne when they put the cross up there it means jesus sits on the throne of a person's life and when they take the cross off and put themselves up there then they're in control of their life i just think it's problematic for people to because they say i don't really have that have Jesus leading my life. He just has to kind of be in my life. Dan or Scott, help me out here. What are you thinking about this? I I would say that there's a missed opportunity there. 
um, because, you know, we're, we're called to die to our flesh. That's a, that's a journey of our sanctification after we do come to salvation and we're justified by Christ alone. Um, but there's opportunity, especially in sports ministry, because we all know when the competition starts to flare up within all of us, that exposes some chinks in our armor, some mm -hmm. weaknesses in our flesh. Um, there's times that we don't handle losing well, or our competitive spirit goes a little overboard and we don't act like a Christian in that moment. And so I think there's opportunity of all ministries in sports ministry for us to help someone to, to overcome their flesh, to rely more on Christ, to die to things that we should be dying to. And so if we're not teaching that, in whatever ministry, if it's if it's some para ministry like you were mentioning, Greg, or our local church sports ministries, there's an opportunity to walk alongside someone and, and really disciple them and say, hey, this is a fleshly thing. I saw come come out of you. I've been there. I wrestle with this or I've overcome this and then in turn disciple that person. So I think it's a missed opportunity if we don't we don't think that through. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think back to Paul and Romans where, you know, it's the being the living sacrifice, but on the same, but right after that, it's the renewing or the transforming of one's mind. And I think when it comes to any sort of ministry, you know, if we have that competitive nature, you know, we have to remember, you know, we are not who we were. We are a new living creature. We're a living sacrifice and we have to yeah, I mean, even times of competition, I, there's times where I get a bit frustrated. It's like, oh, man, we lost one and we're so close and I can allow my ego or my pride to kind of get in the way sometimes. But then at the same time, I have to put that in check and go, well, hey, you know, they won. They played a great game. It was it's it doesn't take away from anything I've done because I played my best out there. It's just the other team was just happened to be better in that moment. So I, I think there's three main issues with this. One is theological. We've talked about that. Mm -hmm. The second has to do with, I think it's just logically fallacious, meaning it doesn't follow. It doesn't make sense. It doesn't, it, it doesn't resonate that I'm, I'm going to accept Jesus in my life just to get eternal salvation. Mm. That's all I need to do. It doesn't make sense. And then the third thing is that I think it's pragmatically pro problematic for people. And, and that's where I want to focus a little bit and ask our, our dear brothers and sisters within AIA to consider this. And, and again, they are properly motivated. They are wonderful people. They have led lots of people to Jesus. But then we have to start to say, are they actually making dedicated disciples. That's where the pragmatics of this is. Because the pro the problem that it is, pragmatically, is that it leads to a methodology. So level one, theological truths, that then end up leading to a level three methodological model that just says, I'm just going to present the gospel and then have them raise their hand, pray that prayer and the four spiritual laws, and I'm done. I'm, I'm off to the other thing, I'm off to the next person. And I just don't see that as being pragmatically successful in any kind of way. And so AIA, brothers and sisters, or anybody, and again, brothers and sisters, we are brothers and sisters. Anybody that's in our sports ministry community, our sports outreach community, if you believe that all you need to do is get them to pray that prayer. Then I'm going to ask you, are, are you really asking them to truly repent? Which means you turn around. We talked about this in the last couple segments about easy believism. Have you really said they've got to turn around? No, they can't live with somebody they're not married with. No, they have to pay their taxes and do legal things. No, they cannot be addicted to drugs or alcohol or pornography. They can, these It's a repentance that I'm turning around. I can no longer use the language that I used to use. I can, and on and on. And I have to start doing some things. And that leads us then to the third point. 
repentance, I need to get baptized. At the very least, if I was baptized as an infant, and that's my tradition, I need to get confirmed publicly. I need to become not just a member of, but a participating member every single week, multiple times a week in a local church. I need to then start to share with others about my faith by living it first and then proclaiming it when they're asking me questions about my changed life. These are the things that I think that the carnal Christian concept falls far short on in making that totally dedicated disciple for Jesus. Guys, take me apart. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think it's it's a good challenge, um, Greg, and I think there's there's opportunity, like you said, for us as brothers and sisters in Christ, for all of us in the sports ministry community to evaluate where we are. And that's that's the purpose behind this book. The saving of sports ministry isn't just about soteriology, although that's a big part of it. It's really helping to develop what it means to be a dedicated, saved disciple of Jesus. And then recognizing well, that's that's just the starting point, not the finish line. What does it look like to grow? Right. Right. But also it's saving these different ministries. It's making them better. Yes. And we all need this. We all we need this in all of our churches on all levels of ministries and programs. We need this in para ministries, and I think it's a healthy challenge. I, I think for all of us as we follow Christ, we recognize um, there's opportunity for us to overcome. There's opportunity for us to change. There are times we don't just repent once. That's a part of our salvation when we recognize that we're lost without Christ because of our sin. And he is our only hope, and we're only saved through him because of our faith in him. Okay, but there's also times, uh, 10 years after we're saved, where we where we recognize my mouth, never my language never changed, and it needs to. And so we repent from that. And maybe we're doing well for 10 years, but there's another thing that pops up, and we mm -hmm. we have to repent from that. And so it's a it's a it's a journey. It's a wonderful journey. It's something we need to talk about. Uh, I've, I've heard the, the phrase, and this is true in athletics, but I think it's definitely true in following Christ. It's a high call and also a high challenge, high call to give your life to Christ, to say, God, I, I surrender my life. However, we, we do that. And Greg, you gave some, some good examples. And sometimes it is a prayer. Sometimes it's something different, but we give our life to Christ. And we, we look back in that moment that you drew a line in the sand and you said, I'm not living for myself. This is this is my coming to salvation. But then we spend the rest of our lives recognizing this is also a high call and a high challenge because we all have our signature temptations. Sometimes they, because we're under spiritual uh, temptation and um, attack and we need God's armor, sometimes they pop up and, and least expected moments, but there they are and we have to overcome. And when we fall short, we repent. And so it is a lifelong journey. It's a challenge. And I think it's just a healthy conversation of discipleship in general. And so I, I welcome it both in my own personal life, in my ministry, and then also uh, with those that we um, are in a partnership with around the world. So I think it's good. Well, let's, let's just wrap up this chapter and, and we end with talking about how, the, how this soteriology works in another segment of the sports ministry world. And that is with camps. Mm -hmm. And particularly those camps that would be run by some para ministries as differentiated from camps that are run by a local church. But here is a situation where somebody comes to camp, they're going to come to a sports camp run by one of our, our brothers and sisters in the sports ministry world. They're often in a rustic or very beautiful setting, or they're in a very um, high level college environment, lots of facilities, and there's lots of attractive people and lots of fun things to do. Uh, and it's a place where somebody, they get caught up in the emotion of it. And then they're asked, would you like to pray this prayer to receive Jesus? And they do. Praise God. We want this. We're not saying you shouldn't do it. But what we're saying needs to be added to that, if you're not a local church and you're a pair of ministry, 
connect every one of those people with a local church. And in fact, have the people from the church go with you to that camp. So there's a natural way, a natural bridge. Even more significant, we would recommend that the leaders of that particular paraministry that is running those camps, they should, the, the volunteers should be recruited from those churches so that it is so natural. And we've got, we've got to get away from this idea that we just get people away, we verbally proclaim the gospel, get them to raise their hand, and then we're done with them. And that's that's a little over the top, and it's a little cold. But I think this happens far more often than we care to admit. And so within the camping world, we just want people to get connected to the ongoing local church so they can mm-hmm. become dedicated disciples of Jesus. Your guys' thoughts? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I mean, because you, I mean, if the church is supposed to be the body of Christ and that it's a make of not only believers, but of disciples that go and make disciples, you have to integrate camps, you know, conferences, whatever it may take. You have to integrate them to the local church. If not, then you're not really making discipleships to the fullest. And again, I think there's opportunity for the local church uh, then to pursue relationships with some of these paraministry sports focused camps or just camps in general uh, to think through, OK, how can we partner? Because we are going to have um, these students, these kids, um, they're going to have a wonderful experience outside of their normal everyday lives. And Greg, you're exactly right. A lot of them, they're very pristine, rustic. Um, there's high emotion that week and something changes and no doubt often it's real. Okay, but what's the next yes. step? So I think if we're intentional with a plan to move beyond the verbal proclamation to a dedicated disciple, which is what we're so passionate about here at CSRM, I think that partnership can really help lead to someone to become a fully dedicated disciple and avoid carnal Christianity, which is what we've been talking about during this podcast, because the, the church was intentional about a partnership. So and, and you didn't steal the thunder, but you, you, I, I was going to add then in. It sounds like we're on our brothers and sisters in the paraministry world, but unless the local church is ready to go and do this, then they're left without any help. And okay. so, the other side of this, carnal Christianity or whatever, is that the local church has to say, "We're going to get with those people because they're really." and we need to get with them and so we can be just as strong at advocating for the local church to get involved as we can for the pair ministry to get the church involved so there you have it no i think that that's a great way for us to end uh because we are out of time i think that challenge because i i'm sure there's frustration on both sides the local church uh sports minister or just the local church in general we have these great pair ministries doing great things with verbal proclamations and people coming to Christ, but then there's no bridge. Either way, mm-hmm. there's frustration, there's no intentionality. We're not working together, as Scott said earlier, but we're all the body of Christ. And I think it just takes the intentionality, the openness to, to work together so that we can avoid carnal Christianity. And uh, we, we just want to encourage you as we wrap up uh, this podcast if you are a pair of ministry or if you're a local church and you're frustrated and you want to work together, if CSRM could help you in, in any capacity with our own networks, if we could kind of come alongside of you and coach you, we are willing to. And if you would just reach out to us uh, through our website, csrm.org, uh, we, would be, we would be happy to get in touch with you. So please follow, uh, we'll, uh, follow up with you after you get in touch with us. So just please know our hearts there. And again, we want to reference the copy of the Saving of Sports Ministry that you can order Mm -hmm. through our website on our online store. And we just wrapped up chapter seven. In our next podcast, we will go into chapter eight and continue the conversation about the Saving of Sports Ministry. 
Thank you so much for joining us here today. We'll see you next time. Take care. The CSRM Podcast is a production of CSRM and their production house, Overwhelming Victory. Dr. Rick Lindell is the executive producer, and Scott Stedman is the associate producer and editor. To learn more about CSRM, visit csrm.org. For more information about Overwhelming Victory, visit overwhelmingvictory.org. The CSRM Podcast is the flagship member of the podcast network Overwhelming Victory Radio. For more information on Overwhelming Victory Radio or to listen to our partner podcasts, visit overwhelmingvictory.org backslash OV radio. For CSRM Podcasts, I'm Mike Maloney. Have a blessed day. <laughs>